Now we are going to talk about uh, generative models, um, which are like sort of the super hot topic right now. Uh, I've linked here the videos from previous year and also the session from Santi. So these sessions are from the master and here you have three hours of class. So they go way more into the details. Uh, today we don't have that much time. And also, like there's people who know already about generative models, others that don't know anything. Um, so um, I would recommend if someone wants like more advanced material, go to these three hours. Okay, so first of all, like what are generative models? It's like something that a lot of people talk about right now but I think that not many of those know what they are talking about. So normally what, what we've seen and you, what you will see uh, across the entire course, it's discriminative modeling. So you're basically modeling P of Y given X. So probability of this being a cat for this image and stuff like this. And generative models are instead uh, you're modeling the distribution, so you're modeling p of x, okay? Um, so here I've put like different examples on classification, regression, and, and generative, which are like the three typical problems, I would say, for different types of domain. Uh, so for example, for images, um, if you're doing classification, you would want to classify who's that. Then for regression, maybe just trying to regress the bounding box of the face. And then with the generative models, the task is completely different. So what you would try to do is this. So these are all fake images. Like these people do not exist. They are the product of, of a network. And this in fact, it's, it's a super new uh, paper. It's from uh, NVIDIA, okay. So, but what's the intuition behind uh, generative models? So what you're trying to do is that giving a training data set, for example, in this case, faces, what we are trying to learn is the distribution of faces. Uh, so if, if you imagine like a space, then in this space, you can imagine like a manifold of what an, a face looks like in a high dimensional space. And if you learn this manifold, it's like a function, then you can sample out of that distribution samples. So once you've modeled distribution, you can start now sampling new images of faces. And this is like for free. You can just like keep sampling, keep sampling, keep sampling, and you would get new faces, um, which is like super important. This is not like a memory network or a hash table where you will just produce images that you've already seen, but instead you're producing completely new faces uh, based on the distribution of your input data. So in this case, they are just like randomly sampling out of this distribution, but you can also condition your sampling strategy. So for example, imagine that you randomly sample this point in space you sample out of this distribution and you obtain one of these faces. And then another random point, you extract this one. Uh, so for example, one nice property of GANs is that the distribution is going to be somehow dense. So you can linearly interpolate between this manifold. So imagine that you have like a surface, you have two points, you're like going from one point into the other. And as you're going through this path, you are sampling out the images. And you get like these sort of nice interpolations, okay? And what I want to say with this is like, when I first saw GANs, it was like, oh sorry, not GANs, generative models. Um, it was like, so what's the purpose of a generative model? It's just like sampling new images. Um, then why is, is this like somehow useful? Maybe just to augment your data set. Um, for example, you're trying to uh, do a face detector. Maybe you want to generate more faces. Um, 
and I did really not understand why people were so hyped about them. And the reason, the reason is not like that you can generate new images. This is just like, let's say, an extra. The true power of generative models are this. So being able to model a distribution. So being able to model giving uh, some samples of a distribution, trying to densely learn that distribution. And that's the, the, the true power of generative models. So here, just to motivate a bit, um, like more use cases, uh, there's this new startup that did a fashion startup. So basically, they design new clothes. And now, basically, they don't have any artist in the team. They just have generative models, which are being trained with huge data sets of fashion. And then they are just simply sampling out of that fashion distribution and generating new sort of clothes. And also you can use this like in anime. Um, you don't need like just to be thinking all the time of new faces. But instead, you can just keep inter uh, generating new ones. Basically, what you're seeing here for every uh, uh, cell grid it's what we were saying at the beginning. So they started from a random point of this manifold, and then they are just keep moving and sampling, sampling, sampling. When I say sampling, it's like the same in a function, right? You have your function, and then sampling is just that you choose a random point, and then you find the y. And this, for me, is the sampling. But this is being done in a high dimensional space, so with a lot of dimensions. But sampling is just this. So as I was saying, good to model complex distributions. Also, um, it's really, really good uh, for hallucinating missing data. So for example, here, um, you're doing super resolution. So you're trying to go from a low resolution image into a high one. So basically, here, what you have is missing data, and you're because you've learned how real images look like, you can refine your, your input image to make it more realistic. And in this way, making it a, a more a high resolution. And the same with um, occlusions or corruptions of your image. So given this image on the top, they are able to hallucinate the, the missing parts. Also, they are really good as a way of manipulating data. So in this case, on the left, uh, given this, so this is like some sort of just segmentations or labels. What you're saying here, I want here street, I want here trees, I want the sky. Then you can run it through a generative model and you obtain this, OK? So with this, you can imagine like producing games or even movies that you don't have to record anything. You can like just generate them automatically, OK? Um, yeah, let me show you here another example they show in the paper. Also with faces. So here they are generating these faces just by drawing the contours. And again, these are just not real people. And then this, you can see this as a sort of a smart paint program, where you no longer need to paint, but just saying, like, what do you want where? And the generative model is, is going to produce that for you. Okay. So these are more like sort of applications of generatives. But for me, the true power that, that they have is that they are super good to tackle and supervise them. Um, and we'll see an example of, of, of what I mean later. So one super important thing to take into account uh, is that there are a lot of generative models. We could do like 10 courses on generative models. And today, we're only going to tackle GANs which is one of the types of generative models. A lot of people like misconcept and they think that they are the same, but GANs are, or generative adversarial networks 
they are just a type of generative models. Okay, and again, we can do in Gantt, we could do like five courses on those. Um, so today, my idea is more to get the intuition of, of somehow how they work. Then we'll see a practical example um, on how to apply this power of unsupervised learning. And then I've also prepared for, for you, then you can check it out. Because it's like somehow scary to train these sort of networks. So I've prepared a call-up again. Um, and this time it's not just testing, but also training. So you can check it out. Uh, you can play with it. And it's going to generate uh, images also. Okay. So because I know here that there are some people who know about Gantt and some people that don't know about them. Um, uh, important. Now we've moved from generative to specifically Gantt. Okay. Uh, how do they work? So imagine that you want to generate cats, right? The thing is, how do you evaluate if what you are generating looks real or not? Because, for example, for the classification, we can just penalize with a grand truth. With segmentation, we were able to do cross entropy uh, and so on. But with cats, like, how do you penalize? How do you say like this image looks like a cat or not with a human made uh, loss? Uh, it, it's, it's sort of tricky. Maybe you could like start saying that, okay, it has to have some eyes, a mouth, and whatever. But this would not produce good uh, results. So instead, um, why not using a network, right? We know that networks are pretty good at like almost everything. So why not using another network as a loss? So how they work is the following. You have a data set of your data distribution that you want to learn. You have some samples of the distribution. And then you also have your generator. So this is the network that it's going to generate the new images. Okay. And then you have another network with, that you can see this as, as the loss. And the work of this network is trying to distinguish from real samples from fake samples. Okay. And basically the idea is that they have to fight each other. So the generator must be able to fool the discriminator. So it must be able to produce images that the discriminator is not capable of distinguishing between real and fake. And because the discrimin so the thing is that while the generator is getting better, the discriminator is also getting better because in order to better distinguish the generator images, it has to improve. So you have this sort of balance. And that's the main problem with Gantt, that you have to maintain this balance. Once one of the two networks gets too good with respect to the other, um, then everything explodes. Because the gradients are not useful anymore. And, and it saturates. Uh, so these are the equations. I won't go into the detail, but just that you, you have them. Basically, this is the loss to train your discriminator. It's just cross entropy. You're tr just trying to distinguish real from fake. And then this is the loss of the generator, which is simply trying to make things the discriminator um, that these are, are real images. Also, I would like to say that this was like the first GAN. Um, Right now, um, the GANs we're using are a bit more complex. But just that so you get the, the idea, and then you can like start exploring more advanced uh, GANs. And the same with without equations. Basically, you would have the discriminator. To train the discriminator, you would uh, generate images from noise. So you have noise. Then this noise is, is run through the generator, which is going to produce a, a, an image. And then you also have real images. And you have to train your discriminator to distinguish between them. And then there's the generator, uh, which is going to try to fool the discriminator. And you are like alternating, uh, alternating between these two. So in one step, you train the discriminator, then you train the generator, then you train the discriminator. And depending on the type of gun, um, you are going to train one more times. For example, sometimes you. You prefer the discriminator to be a bit better than the generator, so we would train more the discriminator. And sometimes uh, you prefer like they are equal. And again, this depends on the specific type of band you use. 
Uh, so this is just more like um, a simple example, because sometimes going with images is, is too hard. So in here, what we are trying to learn is, again, to mimic the Gaussian distribution. Okay. So given some samples of the distribution that are these black dots, we want our generator to be able to model this distribution. So given some noise, then generator is going, is going to produce this in green, which is the, the sampled distribution. Okay. Then in blue, we have like the threshold which the discriminator is using to distinguish between um, the two distributions. Okay. So at the beginning, it's completely noise. And as you go forward, um, the discriminator, it's, it gets better. So now it's like super good at distinguishing if the data comes from this fake distribution or from the real distribution. But as the generator keeps getting better and better and better, it gets a time where the discriminator is no longer capable of distinguishing between them. And at this point is when you say that you've converged. In practice, this never happens. So in practice, you never reach this sort of super equilibrium where the discriminator just uh, cannot distinguish anymore. But this is like, let's say, the, the theoretical approach. And probably some of you have already seen this example. This is a super common one. Um, I, I think it's pretty descriptive. So, so the thing is that this would be the generator. Is someone trying to generate fake money. And then you have your policeman, which is the discriminator, which is trying to distinguish from real and, and fake money. So at the beginning, um, like the generated money, is, it's, it's like super bad. But But when the discriminator evaluates between both of them, um, this like saying it's not even green, we have this information in the gradients. So because we, we compute the loss here on where this discriminator is being able to distinguish or not, then the gradients are going to flow through the discriminator and reach the generator. So basically the generator, because it has the gradient from the discriminator, it's able to know how is he able to, to find out if that's fake or not. And throughout these uh, gradients, you can start optimizing your generator. Okay? And by doing multiple iterations and training and training, eventually you get into a point where, where the discriminator is really capable of generating um, photorealistic data or data that it looks similar to the distribution or the real distribution. Okay, so this is um, so this is the intuition. Okay, uh, but then the thing is, I think the best way of of learning how to use GANs and when to use them is it is it really um, like justified that you are going to use a GAN for a project? It's better to see a lot of projects. Um, so on, on Friday we have an, another like like presentations and. Everyone is like presenting one specific paper. But instead, I think that for you, in my case, it's better if I explain different papers. So they are going to use what, to explain one of their papers like in super detail. This is like my, my last papers. So instead of explaining one in particular, I will try to explain them in general so that you get sort of an intuition on why to use it and how. Um, today, we're going to talk about one of, the, of them. Um, and probably on Friday, we are going to talk about a bit about this one, which is like um, mixing segmentation, what we have previously seen, and GANs, um, which is like a work we just submitted. And then this work I did at Facebook this summer, at Facebook Research, um, where the idea was, OK, so imagine that you are on Instagram, and you see a photo of an influencer or whatever, and you want to try their clothes. So the idea is let's try to transfer the clothes from one single image into an image of myself. And we also did this with GANs. And I will also like sort of explain you the intuition and, and what we did and, and why we did it that way. So today I will be like showcasing this specific case. 
And again, this, this idea is like, like get the paper and instead of just like doing a, a strict uh, analysis, just like explain to you in what cases guns are useful and, and what we did in order to make it better. Also, this is more like, um, I want to say that because a lot of times we tend to think that the grass is greener on the other side, right? That if you want to do like super good research, you have to go to super good universities or you have to go to super good conferences, uh, super good companies. The thing is that uh, this work that we did here in Barcelona um, won the best paper uh, award on our mention in ICCV. So ICCV is one of the conferences that Xavi was talking uh, yesterday, which it, which it has like hundreds of papers. And there, there are papers about, uh, from MIT, from Harvard, Berkeley, Google, Facebook, all of them. And, and we actually won. And I want to mention this um, because if you're thinking about doing research, don't think that you cannot do like super good research here in Barcelona. I think that the level of the community is like speeding super fast. So uh, I would recommend you to check all the groups that there are and just pick the one that you think is more correlated with the sort of, of stuff you would like to, to research about. How are we doing about time? I don't know. Yeah, so we have two slots. Uh, yeah, sorry. So we have till. Okay. So for two, for two slots you have to. Yeah. 40 minutes. We have 40 minutes left? Okay. Um, so what was this paper about? Um, so the previous state of the art, you were able to do this. So given this input image of myself, you could change the expression from a, discrete set, from a discrete set of categories. So you could make it angry, scared, happy, whatever, okay? And, and this was normally done in a fully supervised manner, so with ground truth and everything. Instead, in this work, what we wanted to do is not just being able to discretize it, but also make it continuous. And so if you focus in one of them, you'll see how, how they keep changing. And not only that, but we also wanted to do it in an unsupervised one. So without ground truth, without nothing. Just like random pictures from internet. And this is really what I was playing. So it would be nice to have like the same person in the same position with different expressions. And that would be like a supervised way of doing it, right? Given that, that the input image here, and then this desired expression, we would generate and then we would just penalize the difference. But we don't have that. We just have like random pictures of people. We only have like one picture for every person. And with only this data, we must be able to change the expression of the person. That was like the main objective. Okay. Um, and this is like represented in a, in a visual, in visualizing it just. So given the input image, a desired expression, we want to be able to obtain an image of this desired expression. Uh, okay, yes, and this is a bit complex because we also propose like some improvements on the generators, but just think that this is a generator, okay? This is just a, net, net, a network like before. Uh, don't be scared about like this sort of double representation. So this would be like all the losses that, that we had, but instead, I'll try to show it in a more uh, graphical manner, okay? So if we want to be able to change the expression of people, we need like three main things. Um, the first one being that the image should look photorealistic. That's the, the, the most important thing. Like it must look like a real face. Then the desired expression should be the one in the output image. And the last one is that we also have to maintain the identity of the person. So it's not about like changing the expression and obtaining a different person, but the person must be the same as, as in the input. And with this example, we'll see the, the, I would say like the true power of Gantz, okay? So without generative models or, or in particular without Gantz, I think this would be almost impossible. Uh, 
because it's like super hard to model how a face looks like. Um, if you have some sort of ground truth, maybe you could try to do a classifier or, or I don't know. But without generative models, this is almost impossible. Okay. So let's go step by step and see how we propose to do every one of these like masts of the network. The first one we have to tackle is photorealism. So how do we make the faces look like faces? And, and this is the easiest one. Um, we can simply train a discriminator on that. Okay? So we would have the approval of generator and discriminator as we were showing before with the money, for example. So now um, this is going to guarantee us that at least the output image is a face. It's not guaranteeing anything else. Um, not identity, not expression, but at least is the face of a person. Then we want to constrain the expression itself. So we would like the output expression to be the same as the input expression. And how we can do this is we can train an expression detector that is going to estimate the expression of the generated image and penalize it against the desired one. And because these are all networks, this is, everything is differentiable. So these two losses are going to be backpropagating to the generator. And are going to force them now to make images that look photorealistic and also that they have the same expression. And, and this is the trickiest part. Um, so how do you preserve the identity of the person? Uh, because you've only seen that person once, so you cannot train a classifier on whether to detect that if, if it's that John or not, or because that's any, any person. So what we do is, um, if everything works perfect, then we can replicate the same that we've done, but now, instead of an original image and a desired expression, we can take the generated image and the original expression. So this is the, this expression, not the desired one, but the original. And if everything works, and this person is actually the same, we should be able to obtain an image which is identical to the initial one. Okay? So if this person is the same one, with a different expression than this one, and we ask him to produce this expression in particular, this image and that image should be identical. So by doing this sort of cycle, we can penalize directly the difference between the like reobtained image and the original one. And we can here use perception loss, L1 loss, whatever. The thing is that um, this is huge, right? I mean, in all the talks that they've been talking to you, um, you only had this. You only had like, one, net, one input image, one network, and that's the output. But now, like, look at this craziness, OK? We have lots of networks. Um, and we have to be careful, because this has to fit. In this case, it's fitted in one GPU. Um, so you have to like sort of be consistent and, and be careful with with the space and, and how you organize everything. Okay. But th this proves that that you can lo do like crazy stuff with just one GPU. <laughs> and these are just some results. Some given the input image and a desired expression, we can obtain these sort of images. Um, and as I was saying at the beginning, we can interpolate in the domain. Um, so. So we can obtain the, like these sort of nice results. For example, look at the woman in the beginning. He didn't show the teeth or anything. But the thing is that we learn how teeth look like. So we can interpolate in a realistic manner and produce her teeth. And again, the only image that the model is, is seeing is the first one. Um, so here you have like the same but with GIFs. Um, then also. Um, we took an image from Game of Thrones, and we like edited the, the expression. And finally, here, uh, just to showcase um, like a real example in the wild with like lots of different faces. Um, some of them are small, and big, big illumination changes, different skin tones. Um, uh, so, so these are the, the true power of generative models. Okay, it's not about generating nice cuts or generating nice faces. It's this power of being able to train complex tasks without any sort of supervision. And that would be it. 
so I, I've, I've left here the, the codes. Uh, you can check them out. Um, just like super quick, I can show you the, what you will obtain. So basically here you would have some utils again. You would load the data set, define a generator, a discriminator. This is how the model is trained. Um, it's basically implementing uh, whoop, this from the original paper. Ah, this is a vanilla gun. So this is the, the first gun that was proposed that I'm implementing here. And if you train it for a while, it will start just producing noise. And in like three minutes or so, you will start seeing numbers. Okay, so this is like the, the simplest possible gun. The thing is that you can reuse this code. So instead of training with numbers, you can train it with cuts. And then you will start generating cuts. Or you can do whatever with it. Okay? Um, so I think it's like a better way of learning GANs just like seeing code and how to actually do it, rather than just like some equations. And yeah, that would be it. If you don't have any questions. Ah, just a quick mention. Um, if you are interested in the paper of the faces, um, the code is public, so you can also check that out. Um, yeah, so if you just look for me in GitHub, you will be able to, to find this repo, and all the code is here. Um, so a lot of people is using it. I don't have much time to answer all the questions. Um, so you'll see that there are like a lot of issues open. I, I don't have time to, to be, like, keep closing them. But you have here the code. Um, you can give it a try and, and see how it works. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs>